Come, Holy Spirit, come now, come as you wish. Come, Holy Spirit, come now, come as you wish. Come, Holy Spirit, come now, come as you wish. It's from time to time it's very useful to see somehow timeline, how is the liturgy distributed. And today I would somehow summarize this universal call to prayer. It's very simple defined in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Prayer is the raising of one's mind and heart to God or the requesting of good things from God. If you want some simple image, you should be jealous of these little fellows when you teach them to pray. And the example is very easy. Close your eyes, imagine Jesus standing in front of you, talk to him. And you can be impressed how quickly these little fellows will do it honestly, perfectly, as they can in this age do. This what applies also to us. You have to take it on a grown-up level, but that's what is the prayer is, talking to God and trying to listen. How important the prayer is? The prayer is as important as eating, as sleeping, as dressing, as washing. On certain age of our life, you would need help, but still you have to eat, you still have to sleep. That there is no substitute for prayer. You have to have time for God. It's in exactly the same situation like in the family. You might be working 24-7 for the family and never having time for them. Would they even know you? The same applies here. Time offered to God, if you want to make it in a funny way to motivate yourself, waste time for Jesus or with Jesus. That's what is needed. St. Teresa of Lisieux, the little flower, she said that for me prayer is a search of the heart. It is a simple look turned towards heaven. It is a cry of recognition and of love, embracing both trial and joy. So going to God with everything. And this is how you can defend yourself against so-called distraction during the Mass, during the prayer. Pause for a moment, put yourself in the presence of God. I'm here to worship God. I'm here to be for him. And eventually you will get to such skills that this time of focusing on God will be longer and longer. It will be not time you never will have distractions, but you will become somehow skillful to use the distraction as an invitation to be even more present to God. In the Catechism of the Catholic Church, there is the last section, there are four sections. The last section is about prayer. Uh, what does it mean? First of all, the prayer is teachable. You can teach the person, you can learn. On the other side, it shows how important it is for our spiritual life, for our Christian life. And that's why i just putting some points here. I recommend you read it, you take it for adoration and allow it to be challenged, I mean, encouraged on the one side and challenged on the other side that you can improve your prayer. So man is uh, in search of God and that's uh, proved all over the world. All religions bear witness to man's essential search for God. There is some kind of emptiness in us that nothing and nobody can satisfy. Okay, I'm missing God. And this thing is entering the relationship with him. And God calls man first. We know it, especially from the revelation in the Old Testament, the Hebrew scripture, that God tirelessly calls each person to this mysterious encounter with himself. It's by invitation. Even if you have some kind of experience of sudden and true conversion, you are merely responding to the invitation of God. Because you cannot neither invade the territory of God, his kingdom, nor enter into his spiritual life on your own. It is by being guided, it is by being invited. So prayer unfolds throughout the whole history of salvation as a reciprocal mutual call between God and man. So we have to do something and God has to do something. And God does the bigger part. As usual, you know that God is much more interested in our salvation than we. If you want some visible example, the gardener is much more interested in the growth of the plant than the plant itself. In some kind of analogy, is the same in the spiritual life. So let us start with the Old Testament. The prayer of Moses responds to the living God's initiative for the salvation of his people. He got curious, what is this burning bush? And then God started to talk to Moses. It's not Moses who started. 
Moses was just responding. And the prayer of Moses becomes the most striking example of intercessory prayer. Praying for someone else. Praying for the graces, for the favors for someone else. And this is a very big typology because it foreshadows the prayer of intercession of the unique mediator, Christ Jesus. Only Jesus has this insight, true insight, into the heart of God. No one of us has. And his insight in the humanity as he not only created, but became human, so he has like a more experience of ourselves. So from the midst of the burning bush, God calls Moses to be his servant, his general. I have great idea to bring Israel out of slavery from Egypt. You are my general. You are my leader. You will take them out. I equip you with everything what is needed for this mission. So it is because he is the living God who wants men to live. So God doesn't want our misery. That's why he is caring for people and having his servants, his leaders, to cooperate in plan of salvation. God calls Moses to be his messenger, an associate of his compassion and his work of salvation. This is even more visible during the New Testament when Jesus was inviting people to participate in his miracles, putting water into the jars, and then he made the wine raising up Lazarus and then still asking people to unbind Lazarus. So he was always somehow inviting, having some kind of share. It's maybe in this way, like in the family, when the child is able to help, the parent would be really grateful and joyful that the child wants to participate in the grown-up life. So in the dialogue in which God confines in him, Moses learns how to pray. And He hesitates, he makes false excuses, and above all, he questions God. Yeah, are you alive? You should have this experience. That's what is normal way. You can argue with God, you can disagree with God, you can be angry with God, everything's allowed. One thing is not allowed, only one thing. You cannot be suspicious that God has evil intention. God doesn't have evil wishes, like in the light, there is no room for darkness. In the grace, there is no room for sin. It's very simple. So whatever you disagree, whatever is your trouble, just try to rise up with your mind and heart. Okay, I don't understand. I don't know what he's doing, but there is no evil intention. So does the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend? In many revelations, Faustina and others, Jesus was encouraging when they didn't know how to start talking to Jesus. And Jesus was using this example. Talk to me like you would talk to your friend about everything. One of these dialogues with Faustina, Jesus asked, he shouldn't know how to start. What is the main blockage in your work of salvation? What is the main blockage in your spiritual life? And then she said what she had on her heart. So from this intimacy with the faithful God, Moses drew strength and also determination for his intercession. He was kind of stubborn, he was true human. He was like twisting the hand of God until he achieves what is possible to achieve. So Moses does not pray for himself, but for the people whom God made his own. And he intercedes for them during the battle with the Amalekites. Today, first reading, as long as Moses was holding hands up to the gesture of prayer, the Israel was victorious. So when he got tired, they were holding his hands and then Israel was victorious. Moses also prayed for his sister, for Miriam, to obtain healing for her. Both Aaron, his brother, and Miriam, sister, they were somehow conspiring, complaining against Moses. And the punishment for Miriam, she became a leper, covered with leprosy from head to foot in just a second. And Moses, who could be of final punishment, final just punishment, no, no, he immediately turned to God, please, please heal her, help her. And she was healed. It is chiefly after their apostasy that Moses stands in the bridge before God in order to say his people. You remember in the desert on the Mount Sinai, Moses was 40 days, 40 nights on the top of the mountain and the people left God. They make this golden calf and they left God. So when God said to him, Moses, your people left me. And then Moses said, like in the family, my people, that's your people. 
It was people are they. And so like in the family, when the children behave, they are my children, my child. You know, when they misbehave, they are your children. Yeah? That's straight from the Bible. He was even going, you want to destroy them? Destroy me first. And this is the role of the mediator that he will even sacrifice himself to save the others. That's how powerful this intercession could be. So see the arguments of Moses' prayer intercession. God is love. So if God is love, he is wishing well to everyone. There is no evil intention in God. And this is the foundation for every prayer. So God is therefore righteous and faithful. God cannot contradict himself when he once promised he will not break his promise, he will follow up. And also God must remember his marvelous deeds. Since his glory is at stake, he cannot forsake his people that bear his name. This is very nicely expressed a few hundred years later, King David, when he was writing this Psalm 23. And for your name's sake, for the sake of God, he will take care for us. It's a very simple image. If the sheep looks nice, cared for, and bringing also big profit later to the shepherd, the shepherd has good reputation. He knows his jobs, he cares for the sheep. But if the sheep looks like a skeleton, he is spoiling his reputation. And look, God put himself in this position that he obliged himself to care for us, because if not, his reputation will be spoiled. That's a sign of love, you know, the sign of care he's ready to provide. And Jesus teaches us the new way of praying, how to pray. It's very important to know and next step to pray, and we rely on this, what Jesus taught us, using the way as he taught apostles, and we have this long tradition in the church. There are three principal parables on prayer are given to us by St. Luke. We have this ERC in the liturgy and are coming three parables, one after other on Sundays. We had previous Sunday this persistent friend. Now we have the persistent widow this Sunday. Next Sunday is coming the Pharisee and the tax collectors. They're like the rules or hints what to do, how to pray, how to engage with God. So the first parable is the persistent friend. It invites us to urgent prayer. Knock and it will be opened to you. This is his example. If this guy who had food, who locked his door because it was night, if he would not open because of his friendship, he would open because he would like to sleep. You cannot sleep if somebody is banging at your door during the night. So that's how important is the persistence and knocking, coming to God, I want, I need it, please respond to me with your wisdom, with your goodness. To the one who prays like this, the Heavenly Father will give whatever he needs, not whatever he wants, whatever he needs, and above all the Holy Spirit who contains all gifts. It's only in Luke's Gospel when he says, you want the highest gift? Pray for the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the highest gift which contains all kinds of gifts and is a very good prayer and maybe especially for our parish as we have this title of the Holy Spirit. So the second parable is the persistent widows, is today a gospel. It centers on one of the important qualities of prayer. It is necessary to pray always, without ceasing, and with the patience of faith. God sometimes waits because he wants us to give more than we ask. And he waits that we are ready. He's not stingy. Or, as we had previous Sundays, that he's showing us how much he should be trusted. If he doesn't respond, he knows what he is doing. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Uh, this is a very serious warning coming straight from the mouth of Jesus, very puzzling sentence, but the response should be, increase my faith. Instead of worrying if there will be faith on earth, there are these two prayers given us in the Gospel, help my disbelief or increase my faith. We should pray to increase our faith, maybe at, you know, even if on a daily then weekly basis, because this what keeps us intact, this what organizes our spiritual life, this what keeps us in unity with God. And the third parable, which will come next Sunday, the Pharisee and the tax collector. It concerns the humility of the heart that prays. God be merciful to me, a sinner. 
the Pharisee came and he was saying what he did not do, and the tax collector was hardly in the synagogue, just crossing the threshold and confessing his sins. God have mercy on me. Be merciful to me, a sinner. The church continues to make this prayer its own, Kyrie eleison. It's very useful to know it. It's very useful even to use it because this expression, Kyrie eleison, is used only as the prayer. So you don't have like to think, let me pray. It's Kyrie eleison is already prayer. So it's a very useful phrase if you need some mercy of God. And Jesus openly entrusts to his disciples the mystery of prayer to the Father in a new way, as you know, the our Father, but it's not only this. So what is new is to ask in his, in Jesus' name. I remember as I was a teenager, I was wondering why these all prayers have to be finished for Jesus Christ our Lord. Either this uh, short or long uh, conclusion. It's always for Jesus Christ our Lord. And that's why, because Jesus told us to pray like this. Faith in the Son introduces the disciples into their knowledge of the Father. And in this new covenant, the New Testament, the certainty that our prayers will be heard and answered is founded on the prayer of Jesus through Christ our Lord. So don't be shy to use it, because this is expressing our trust and our obedience to Jesus as he instructed us to pray like this. So far as he said on the Last Supper, you didn't pray in my name. Now I tell you, pray in my name and your prayer would get an like extra booster to make it more reliable and more quicker reaching the ears of God. So Jesus hears the prayers of faith expressed in words. Don't put this prayer aside. St. Teresa of Avila, she said so clearly, this is the very first prayer which you learn. Even if you grow in faith, you have to speak to God, you have to ask from God. And she was claiming that if you don't learn how to ask, you will never learn how to say thank you, how to say I'm sorry, how to glorify God just for being God the other levels of prayer. That's why it's so important. There's one trap with words, and I want to make you aware and don't fall into this trap. When you talk, when you close your eyes, you talk to Jesus, you put yourself in the presence of Jesus, you don't have to close eyes, you can look at cross or picture, but make sure that you are talking to him. The trap, very fine trap, is that you say the words but you are talking to yourself. And that's not prayer. That's really a waste of time. <laughs> as some people are telling that prayer is a waste of time, as long as you talk to God, it's never a waste of time. But if you talk to yourself, it's a waste of time. Go and rest. So the prayer of in words, the leper, the one leper or ten lepers who came to Jesus, they asked, if you will, you can heal me. And they were healed. The daughter of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue who came to Jesus, my daughter, my little one, 12 years old, is dying. Please, please come quickly, save her life. Jesus came and she was saved. The Canaanite woman who was pleading for her daughter who was possessed by the evil spirit. If you see this gospel, she was approaching Jesus three times. That's why we pray many times, three times, repeating our prayers. After the third time, Jesus reacted, Jesus responded, he cured her daughter. Jesus responded to the prayer of the thief, the so-called good thief, crucified on the right side of Jesus. This thief was just simply saying, in your kingdom, is there any room for a person like me? And that was enough to be contrite and to be pardoned and received to the heavenly kingdom. Jesus hears the prayers of faith expressed in silence. So look your desires, because he knows what we desire, he knows what we would ask before we even come to the prayer, and he might respond to this desire. Just a few examples that you can get it. The bearers of the paralytic. It's very strange that neither them nor the sick person said anything. Neither I'm sorry, thank you, or anything. But Jesus had seen something, the desire, he had seen love. Have you ever wondered that when Jesus was preaching and they couldn't even come close to him, when he was looking for faith, he looked up to the dismantled roof. When he was looking for love, he was looking up. 
and he rewarded faith and love. The prayer of Sai is the woman with a hemorrhage who touches his clothes. She was somehow talking to herself, encouraging herself, I have to come close to Jesus, I have to touch him, if I touch him, I will be healed. She never said anything to Jesus, she later confessed what happened to her, but she didn't ask, it was a silent desire. And also the tears and ointment of the sinful woman, when she didn't say anything, and Jesus declared that her sins are forgiven, even if there are many, because of her repentance are forgiven. Jesus hears and answers the urgent request of the blind man. In Matthew are two men, in Luke is one. So Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. And this is like a magic formula. If you anything want to remember some short prayer, this is a very biblical prayer. The title of the Messiah, son of David, have mercy on us. And the miracle was done. Jesus always responds to the prayer offered in faith. Men of this healing infirmities, do you want to be healed? And do you have faith to be healed? And the moment they will answer, I have faith or increase my faith, they were healed. So he was forgiven sins. The prayer offered with faith. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. He sometimes added, do not sin anymore. Do not make you turn wrong direction. So to summarize today's teaching, St. Augustine, the Church Father, he put it so clearly. He summarizes the three dimension of Jesus' prayer. Jesus prays for us as our priest. This is what we experience during the Mass. Whenever we ask through Christ, our Lord, you are putting your prayer on his shoulder, on his cross, whatever you would imagine. He is our priest, his mediator between human and God. Jesus prays in us as our head. This is the different image. This is what was given to us by St. Paul, the, the image of the Church is the human body. The head is Jesus, the body is we, so head and we is one church, one body, one a church. So that's why we go to the head who directs everything, who has much more insight in Godhead and in humanity, and also Jesus is prayed to by us as our God, as we know that he's God, man, and we pray to him that he will intercede for us. So St. Augustine wrote, therefore, let us acknowledge our voice in him and his voice in us. When we give our intention to him, our intention goes with his voice to Heavenly Father. And we have to recognize the inspiration which is coming from Jesus, from the Holy Spirit, how to pray and what to pray. So there is no really substitute for prayer. There is no really excuse not to pray. And try, try to waste time for Jesus, because it's really never really wasting time. I heard this from one of my friends. I'm praying daily three rosaries, yeah? And when I returned, I didn't do it for a few years, I returned to this uh, tradition, three rosaries. It's amazing how Mother Mary is uh, organizing time, that there is time to pray this rosary. Driving, waiting, walking, washing dishes. <laughs> Something what doesn't need much other engagement of thinking, and you can use this empty time for prayer. But you have also to have time for Jesus. Not only on the way, not only somewhere doing something, having a real time for your family, having a real time for God. That's what really proves the engagement, that does prove love, and increases our faith and love for the amazing grace of God.